of the principal superposition. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, you're going to be using this a lot when you have systems where uh, you have a number of complicated loading types, and especially uh, systems where the uh, you got too many supports uh, to be able to figure out what the reactions at those supports are based upon just the equilibrium conditions, equilibrium equations. So essentially, uh, stress and displacement at any particular point can be uh, found by taking the stress or displacement that would be caused by at that point by uh, an individual component and then apply it separately to each member. So, um, <clears throat> well, separately to the member at, at that point. So we need to be in the linear elastic regime. So uh, the loading must be linear related to the stress or displacement. Uh, so, you know, we don't have any plastic yielding going on. And uh, the geometry can't change too much. You can't flex too much or else uh, yeah, essentially, so some some of that, uh, these assumptions uh, get lost a bit. So you know, if we get a lot of angle changes uh, uh, that uh, occur, then we uh, then then our result will be off basically. So if we had say a loading situation like this, uh, and well, okay, so we know we have a reaction here. A Y, and we know we have a reaction here, B Y. The only thing we've got to, to give us information about what's going on there is some of the forces in the Y direction is equal to zero. So we can't solve for that. Uh, we can't use moments here because you know, the line of action uh, for those reactions are passing through the same point. Uh, so you know, there's no offset between them. So we don't have enough information here to figure out what's going on based just upon equilibrium. Uh, so uh, we're going to have to base this upon uh, displacement. Uh, uh, so we, we need to figure out uh, kind of a condition. Well, what sort of condition this loading situation here is going to impose upon us? And what, uh, so we call that a compatibility condition. So for this one, suitable compatibility condition here is we have zero displacement at any one end of the bar with respect to the other. And then what we can do is we can break this uh, we can break this bar up into two separate parts, one section here and one section here, where the force in this section on the top here will be F A or A Y or whatever whatever you want to call it. And then the force in this one will be uh, negative FB. Because again, we're, we're um, and that is just based upon the uh, uh, the directionality there is uh, just based upon the, well, I guess it could be based two ways. <laughs> you could either be basing it upon the assumption that uh, you know, your reactions are always, always going to be positive, or we could base it on, upon the the assumption that uh, when we push down on that bar, and the reactions are going to need to be positive on both of them in order to to resist that uh, resist that force. Uh, but anyways, uh, so again, pulling on the top of this bar puts that one in tension. Pushing on the bottom of the bar puts that one in compression. So our internal loading. Uh, is uh, opposite from one another, uh, opposite in sign from one another, because the loading, you know, the where that load is applied, uh, it switches the the condition. So we're talking that the sum of the displacement between A and B needs to be zero. Then essentially, uh, the sums of the displacements in each of those sections need to be zero. <coughs> so we can just add that up. So the force in A times the length of A divided by AE minus FB, because again, it's a negative loading condition, negative internal force, times the length between C and B uh, divided by AE is equal to zero, 
obviously we can just uh, multiply out those AEs in this instance. Uh, in this instance, and that's not always the case, because we could have situations where, say, the, the diameter changed uh, between, uh, between A, I guess I should have put C there, between A and C and C and B. Uh, so anyways, but solving for that, we can solve for FA uh, is going to be equal to P times uh, the length between CB and L, and then likewise. Uh, so that's just, that's found for just by solving for FA in terms of FB and then taking uh, that value and plugging it into this equation here. So that's one suitable compatibility condition uh, for this loading. So let's let's show you uh, another possible one. Uh, so say we've got uh, the steel rod here. It's got a diameter of 10 millimeters fixed to the wall here A, and then uh, it's got a gap here of 0.2 millimeters right there before it's loaded. And then it has this collar here at C uh, where the oh, uh, where the load is applied. So we want to figure out what the reaction is at A. Uh, if the rod is subjected to an axial force of uh, 20 kilonewtons as shown, and we're going to ignore, ignore the size of the collar there. Now, uh, let's scroll down here, make that a bit smaller. Okay, so we can split this up. Uh, into kind of we can split the bar up into the two segments uh, uh, basically and um, well first off let's see <laughs> let's see uh, let's let's make sure it's actually going to hit that wall <laughs> uh, so our if if we didn't have anything going on at B uh, the change in length that would occur between A and C uh, and we, when we loaded this up, that would be equal to the 20 kilonewtons times the um, uh, length, so 40 millimeters, sorry, 400 millimeters, all divided by our AE. So if it's got a diameter of uh, 10 millimeters, that's a radius of 5 millimeters, so pi r squared that gives us an area of equal to seventy eight point five three millimeters squared <coughs> squared and then the uh, Young's modulus of our uh, steel there, 200. Oh, that should be 200 gigapascals. I feel silly. Eh, 200 gigapascals, GPA. My apologies there. Okay, so 200 gigapascals. Uh, so again, a megapascal is a newton per millimeter squared. Uh, so gigapascal will be a kilonewton per millimeter squared. So our per millimeter squared, our millimeter squared there cancel out, our kilonewtons cancel out. What we're left here will be in millimeters. So 20 times 400 divided by 78.53 times 200. So that would equal 
0.509 millimeters. So if we just load this up, it's going to hit the wall. But we're not allowed to hit the wall. We're not allowed to go past the wall. It hits the wall and it's going to stop. So what's going to happen here is we're going to get a situation where we have this 20 kilonewtons. We're going to have a reaction at A, AX, and we're going to have a reaction at B, BX. <clears throat> so we can, uh, uh, we don't know what either of those are yet, so we're going to need to base this upon the displacements. Uh, so what we do know is we've got that uh, 0.2 millimeter gap, with, which is our room for expansion. Uh, so essentially uh, we can break this bar up into two segments. We can break this bar up into the segment between uh, a and C. And it'll have a tension of in, an internal tension of AC. And then we can break it up into the uh, segment between uh, C and B. And it'll have an internal compression of bx uh, and then of course uh, uh, we're st we'll, we'll still have our usual um, uh, you know we still we're still going to have the the same relationship between those two values the sum of the forces in the x direction is equal to zero so that'll be equal to negative ax plus 20 kilonewtons minus bx. So if we solve for say ax, ax would be equal to 20 kilonewtons minus bx. <clears throat> so got those two segments and between the two of them the net displacement needs uh, can uh, needs to be 0 0.2 uh, millimeters. All right. 0 0.2 millimeters. So 0 0.2 millimeters needs to be equal to our delta AC plus our delta, that looks more like a sigma, delta, there we go, and our delta BC. So just uh, plug, uh, plugging that in, 0 0.2 millimeters. Uh, so for AC, the uh, I'm going to plug, I'm going to use the value for AC here that's solved for in terms of BX. So our AC there is equal to 20 kilonewtons minus BX times the length, 400 millimeters, divided by our AE. Actually, let's just figure out what AE is. 78.53 uh, times 200. So that those two terms there are 15706. And that is uh, 15706 millimeters squared times kilonewtons per millimeter squared. So 15706 kilonewtons is that, that value there. So uh, that term will show up in both of them. Six kilonewtons. And then plus our uh, delta BC but uh, because our delta, because our, because uh, uh, this is, because uh, this is, comp uh, the, the force there is compressive based upon our BX, we're subtracting here, so BX times 800 millimeters. No, here, I'll make this right off the page here, there we go. 
800 millimeters divided by uh, 15706 kilonewtons. So we can take the 15706 kilonewtons, multiply it out to the other side. Uh, that times the 0.2 millimeters. That gives us 3141.2 kilonewton millimeters. And then what's left is just uh, the stuff on the top here. Uh, so we'll have 20 kilonewton, sorry, uh, of 20 kilonewton, uh, 20 kilonewtons times 400 millimeters. So 20 times 400, that gives us 8,000 kilonewton, kilonewton millimeters minus 400 BX minus another 800 BX. So I'm just going to write that as minus 1200 uh, BX, sorry, 1200 millimeters BX. Okay, so I uh, just subtract out the uh, 8,000 from the, uh, uh, what do we call it, uh, the 13, uh, the 30, 3141, so 3141.2 minus 8,000, that gives us negative 4,858.8 kilonewton millimeters is equal to negative 1200 millimeters BX. So divide out the 1200 millimeters and we get BX, oh sorry, divide out the negative 1200 millimeters and we get BX is equal to uh, 4.049 uh, kilonewtons. So, uh, Mag, you know, the, the magnitude we solve here for is positive, and what that means is that the direction we guessed uh, for where BX should be pointed is correct. So we got that, and then we're just able to solve for AX, because we know AX is equal to 20 kilonewtons minus BX. So our AX is going to be... Continuous fifteen point nine five one kilonewtons. <clears throat> All right, uh, yeah, so um, from there, uh, it, yeah, so we, we solve for our reactions there. I think that was all the question asked for. Um, yeah, uh, that's all the question asked for. So that's uh, there, there. There's our answers for this right there. Obviously, I, I'd round that to. Uh, let's see how many significant digits were we given here. Uh, <laughs> the zero point two millimeter. Uh, let's round that to uh, uh, BX. Is equal to four and AX is equal to 16 kilonewtons. Uh, yeah, so that'll be and again that's based upon the directionality we showed on our uh, on our diagram uh, when we wrote it here. So you might uh, um, I guess depending upon how you, uh, uh, how consistent you want to be, you, may, you might want to reformat that uh, to have B. I guess, it, you know, if if you're one of those people who kind of wants to follow the exact same process for every problem, uh, then it's essentially uh, I would suggest that you always pick your reactions uh, as being in the positive x direction, even if you expect them to be negative. So then the values you're, you're showing up with uh, are, uh, are kind of what you expect. So we got that one. Um, let's, uh, let's do this example now too. Uh, let's get a chance here. 
And it's going to move this up here and shrink it down a little bit. Okay. So we got this post. Uh, it's an aluminum post reinforced with a brass core. Uh, the aluminum is not as stiff as the brass core. Uh, uh, and then if this assembly supports an axial load pushing down uh, of nine kips applied to a rigid cap on the top, uh, what is going to be the average normal stress in the aluminum and the brass? So different, different setup, different compatibility condition. So it, here we got these two things bonded together and they're, they're going to be, you know, if we push down on that rigid cap, when we push down on it, they're each going to have the same, uh, you know, that, that cap's going to move it up and down the same, you know, it's rigid, so it's just moving up and down. So the displacement in both the aluminum and the brass is going to be equal. So that's a compatibility condition. Displacement, brass is equal to displacement, aluminum. So if we break that up, uh, and then we do a free body diagram of say what's going on with the cap. Got this cap here, we're pushing down on it with nine, nine kips. Then you're gonna have uh, the force applied by the core and the force applied by the, uh, uh, the outside, the, 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 the aluminum. I guess tube maybe or no. yeah anyways so each of those is going to be pushing back up on the brass so we'll uh, do, do, do. so we got the brass say oh wait no, F brass And then we got the force from the uh, aluminum. I'm just going to kind of have it split here to show it's being, it's pushing up, uh, you know, uh, it's put, it, it, it's around the brass core. So it's pushing up on the, on that cap around the brass core. But it, again, if you, it's going to be a distributed load that is centered on the same spot that the uh, that the load from the, the brass core will be. So there, you know, there's not going to be any net moment from that force. So the brass, F aluminum. So again, sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to zero. Therefore, F A L plus F brass minus nine kip is equal to zero. So we can solve for the uh, force in the aluminum. That's just going to be equal to nine kips minus the force in the brass. <coughs> Now we just got our compatibility condition here. So uh, we're pushing down on the uh, we're pushing down on both of them. Their displacement's the same. So the displacement of the brass is going to be equal to uh, negative f brass. Because again, if we just I just want to reiterate, if we just do a free body diagram of the brass post, if it's pushing up on the, uh, oh sorry, if the brass post is pushing up on the cap, then that means that the cap is pushing down on the brass post the same amount. So uh, based upon that, we would expect, you know, we, we expect this thing to be uh, in, com in compression. So negative F brass, times its length, uh, so 1.5 feet. I'm going to put that as 18 inches. 
divided by EI. So uh, what do we got here? Its diameter is, sorry, its radius is one inch. Uh, so one inch pi r squared is just going to be pi inches squared. And the Young's modulus for the brass, uh, 15 times 10 to the 3 KSI. 15 times 10 to the 3. Uh, 15 times 10 to the 3 KSI. Uh, I'm just going to put that as 15 times 10 to the 6 PSI, pounds per square inch. So we got those inches squared, those cancel out. And then displacement of the uh, aluminum can be found in a similar manner. And again, I'm just going to uh, go ahead and uh, use a uh, punch in the uh, value for the force of the aluminum that we solved for based upon the uh, 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 force in the brass. So again, negative for the same reasons, negative 9 kip minus F brass times 18 inches. They're both the same length, different, uh, different areas. So again, uh, we need the area here. We just need to take the area of the total minus the area in the middle. Uh, so if, uh, for the outside portion, our radius is 2 inches. So pi r squared will be 4 pi, uh, four, 4 pi inches squared minus that inside, so minus 1 pi. So we're left with 3 pi. 3 pi inches squared times the 10 times 10 to the 6 pounds per inch squared that we were given here as the Young's modulus for the aluminum. So again, that cancels out, that cancels out. And these two things need to be equal. So simple enough. Uh, just rearrange our equations. Negative F brass times 18 inches divided by, well, let's see here. Let's, yeah, actually, here, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to do here. Uh, times 8 times pi times 15 times 10 to the 6 pound force is equal to negative 9 kips. Oh, sorry, I was a bit off page there, wasn't I? Minus F brass times 18 inches divided by 3 pi times 10 to the 6 pound force. So there's a few things we can kind of just cancel out here. So we divide everything by 18 inches, that goes away and that goes away. Realistically, the actual length of the thing doesn't, doesn't affect this thing at all. Um, unless we get really large and it starts buckling, but that's uh, next year. <laughs> uh, our pi cancels out here and here. Uh, our times 10 to the... Si oh, wait, uh, sorry, that was... Ah, that was bad for me. I wrote 10 to the 6 pound forces when I was supposed to have 10 times 10 to the 6 pound, pound force. My bad. Uh, so anyways, the, the 10 to the 6 pound force part cancels out. The 10 and the 15 do not. And uh, we can now we can just cancel out the, the negative signs there. Uh, and if I just... Mul oh, Multiply out to solve for F brass. That is going to be equal to 15, with that 15 over here, 
times 9 kip minus f brass divided by 30. Or we'll just uh, 15 and 30 cancel out to divide it by 2. <clears throat> so 9.5 kip minus 0.5 f brass so add the 0.5 out 1.5 f brass and then divide. So f brass is equal to 3 kips. So f, f brass is equal to 3 kips. Then uh, we we know what the f aluminum is as well. So our f aluminum is 9 kips minus f brass. So that's going to be equal to 6 kips. So uh, from there, we were asked to solve for the uh, stress level. So again, our stress level is equal to the force divided by the area. You know, is it just plain axial stress? Again, here, keeping in mind when we say force, we're talking about the internal load. So again, we solve for F brass and we solve for F aluminum uh, as positive based upon the fact we guessed what it should be. Uh, but uh, when we go to translate it to, to the uh, uh, translate it to um, the internal load, again, on our core, we're still pressing down there, we're pressing up at the, at the bottom. So this, this is going to be uh, what causes us to have a negative internal stress. So our negative internal stress there uh, for the brass, 3 kip divided by the area of the brass, which was pi uh, inches squared. So 3 divided by pi, that will be negative... 0.955 KSI kips per square inch or negative 9, sorry, 955 PSI. Similarly, oh, I guess I should have put brass here for the aluminum. We're still at F over A, uh, so negative, and, and you know, still keeping in mind our sign convention for uh, uh, for that. This is going to be negative stress because it's compressive. So negative six kip divided by the area of the aluminum, which is three pi inches squared. Now that gives us. Uh, so 6 divided by 3 times pi is negative 0.637 KSI or negative 637 PSI. So yeah, two examples of two examples of using different compatibility conditions for your principal supervision superposition problems. Uh, I will again I will stress here that the choosing the proper compatibility condition is probably is, is absolutely the most important step. So you, you want to be making sure that you know you're able to take the scenario <laughs> that you're given and describe what equations you know figure out what describe what, what equations describe that scenario. So you may be limited to 
having a certain amount of uh, di displacement that's allowed. You may be in situations where uh, the forces through different components are going to be the same, so the load's the same, uh, stuff like that. There's also uh, kind of one other way to go about doing these, I call this the force method analysis. Uh, so essentially, uh, the way this works is, uh, what we do is say that the, dis yeah, the displacement with the supports there is equal to the displacement when the one of the supports is removed plus the displacement of just the just that support load so we basically uh, pick one of those things to be re treated as redundant uh, and then have only that and then the to you know the the tums the sum total of the displacements needs to be the same for both of those so it's a slightly different approach that kind of works out to the same thing so for example yeah if we temporarily remove the effect of that support B, then you get, again, a statically determinate problem with a certain amount of displacement due to just that load. And again, that'll only be in this segment here. And then our compatibility condition is zero displacement uh, here. So we just add back uh, the deflection due to B. And Ian, B is expected to be pointed up, so this should be negative. And then, you know, just solving for our equations based upon, uh, based upon, uh, you know, normal, uh, our normal uh, axial strain. Plug and play, get to the same results. So a slightly different approach that uh, you, you might be a, more, a bit more comfortable with. Anyways, that's... Uh, yeah, that, uh, that is our principles of superimposition.